Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of, the lessons, series of lessons is entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. Hmm, that's an interesting title. This is the lesson number four in that series entitled To Love the Lord Your God. It's the lesson for October 23 of 2021. And we like to begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. Father, we bow our heads now, asking for your presence among us, not that you're ever absent from us, but asking for your guidance as we study together this portion of the book of Deuteronomy, where it talks more about you and about your relationship to us. May it become more real to us than ever before, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. In the Jewish religion, one of the most important prayers is taken from Deuteronomy 6. It is known as the Shema, based on the first Hebrew word of the prayer, from the root Shama, which means to listen or even to obey, a word that appears again and again, not just in Deuteronomy, but all through the Old Testament. The first line of the Shema reads like this. You want to Read that, Jim. Do you want to try? <laughs> Shema Israel Adnoi Elihu Elihunu Elihinu Adnai Achad. It's not fair to ask him. <laughs> Read a little Hebrew there. It not means, even written in Hero Hebrew. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy six four, New King James Version. Many times when Jews, when Jews pray, they cover their eyes, and the idea being to let nothing distract them from thinking about God. This first line of the Shema is deemed an aff affirmation of the monotheistic nature of Adonai Eloheinu, the Lord our God, and Israel's loyalty to him alone and to no other God. In fact, it also could be read as the Lord is our God, from the Bible study guide. Okay. This expression was the beginning of Moses' first speech to the children of Israel as they camped on the plains of Moab across the flooded Jordan River from Jericho. It was intended to be the very basis for the Jewish economy and the principle that would set them apart, holy, right, as a people from all others. Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2. Carrie? These are all the laws that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. Obey them in the land that you are about to enter and occupy. As long as you live, you and your descendants are to honor the Lord your God and obey all his laws that I am giving you, so that you may live in that land a long time. That's from American Bible Society, Holy Bible. Okay, now compare the King James, slightly different version of that same passage. Now, these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which are commanded thee, thou, thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Holy Bible, King James Version, 2009. Okay, now notice the comparison there. <clears throat> if we look at the, the, the modern Good News translation, as long as you live, your descendants are to honor the Lord your God, right? And down here in the King James, it says you are to fear the Lord your God. Why that difference? Can it really be true that if Israel had carefully followed the Ten Commandments, which had been just repeated to them in Deuteronomy 5, that all would have gone well with them and they would have become a mighty nation? Is that possible? You bet. There was a promise. Yeah, and it was God's promise. Yeah. The two great principles embodied in the law of God, to love God and love our neighbors, are further spelled out in the Ten Commandments. 
The first four talk about how we should re we love God and relate to Him. And the last six talk about how we should love our neighbors. If we really love God with all our heart and our neighbors as ourselves, would that solve the problems in our world today? One, one word answer. Yes. yes. <laughs> but there's a problem. Can you command someone to love? In the Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon, it says, in the Hebrew, the word your, for your God, your heart, your might, is in the singular. Ooh. What does that mean? Does that mean we're individuals in God's sight and we don't get saved as a group? Loving is not something we do as a group. If each individual in the group is not individually loving, the group is not loving. A major part of our lesson for this week discusses the question of what it means by the term to fear God. So we're going we're gonna to look at that, several aspects of that. They were commanded to fear God. Can you really fear someone and love them, him or them, at the same time? In the Greek from the New Testament now, there are four words for love. One, philia, means brotherly love or familial love. Epithu two, epithumia, which means passion. It can mean love or it could mean even hate in certain circumstances. Three, eros, which means sexual love. Or, but four, agape means principal love. Those, of course, are Greek words. Principal love means to love something or someone because it is the right thing to do. Treat them as if they are of worth. The English translation of the Hebrew word for fear can mean everything from honor or respect to abject terror. This is a limitation in the Hebrew language and in, in, in pretty much in Greek language as well of the ancient script. Based on the context in which the word is used, we must decide what the meaning is in that setting. That becomes apparent when we consider a modern translation and compare it with a King James Version. Let's look at an, another couple of, uh, of verses, one from the King James Version first and then one from the Good News Bible. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, And now, Israel, what do, doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's King James. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, the Good News Bible says, Now, people of Israel, listen to what the Lord your God demands you and worship the Lord and do all that he commands. Love him, serve him with all your heart. So, fear the Lord from King James. My Good News Bible says, listen and worship. We should not have any trouble, any problem with honoring God, respecting Him, even regarding Him with, with awe. Certainly, He is powerful. He symbolizes justice and righteousness, and He re represents everything that is right. Jim, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. In the past, you were spiritually dead because of your disobedience and sins. At that time, you followed the world's evil way, you obeyed the ruler of the spiritual powers in the spa in space, the spirit of who now controls the people who disobey God. Actually, all of us were like men and lived according to we're like our, them. We're like them and lived according to our natural desires, doing whatever s suited the wishes of our own bodies and minds. In our nature condition, natural condition, we like everyone else were destined to suffer ang God's anger. But God's mercy is so abundant and His love for us is so great that while we were spiritually dead in our disobedience, He brought us to life through Christ, with Christ. It is by God's grace that you have been saved. In our union with Christ Jesus, He raised up, excuse me, raised us up with Him to rule with Him in the heavenly world. He did this to demonstrate for all time to come the extraordinary greatness of His grace in the love He showed us in Christ Jesus. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, 
but God's gift so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created for us a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. Okay. So there's a lot of words, and I, I, I'm sorry we don't have a chance to sort of break it down and sort of digest it uh, as a group and maybe for your benefit. But basically, what that's saying to us is God has made the arrangements. He's gracious, he's kind, he's loving, and he wants to give it to us as a gift. Salvation. Notice that we, in our natural condition, were children of wrath. What does wrath mean? Children of wrath, that means we're separate from God. God's wrath is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway and thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. In other words, spiritually dead because of our disobedience and sins. Why would God love people like that? We're his children. And he wants most of all to be our friend, John 15, 15. Being a friend is even better than being, <laughs> being a child. I, I deal with a lot of people at the clinic and I was talking to a lady, you know, well, do you have any siblings? Well, yeah, I have a sister that lives somewhere up in the north somewhere and I have a brother I haven't talked to him for years and years and years. I don't get along with him. Yeah. You know, <laughs> kind of, no, that's not the kind of family we want, we want to be. God wants us to be his friends. In light of all that, the most amazing thing is that God himself came down to this earth to live that incredible life and to die for us while many of us were hating him. Think about it. The children of Israel were lying prostrate at the foot of Mount Sinai, listening to God. They were scared to death. And then later, having the Ten Commandments repeated to them, just before crossing the Jordan, certainly should have recognized all that God had done for them. I mean, 40 years. You don't, you don't plant, you don't plow, you don't bother to garden, you know, you just take your animals along with you, everything is provided for you, you go out and collect the man and the, mo I mean. Your shoes don't wear out. Your shoes don't wear out. Sex, none of your women, die. none of the ladies are, have abortions. Miscarriages. Miscarriages, really, yeah. Um, certainly they must have recognized that God was caring for them. Despite their sins and their mistakes and their rebellions, God still loved them. I sometimes when thinking about the, the way God had cared for them, suppose you had been born out there in the, in, in the wilderness somewhere along the way, and the only thing you had ever eaten in your life was manna and then some of the meat prepared from the sacrifices and so forth. That's the only thing you'd ever eaten, well, besides mom's milk. What would you think, and all of a sudden you get into the land and now there's corn, there's wheat, would you say, no, I, I'd rather go back to the manna? Good question, right? Well, let's look back once again, and, and we're going to try to tie what we read in Deuteronomy here with what we read in Revelation. Again, we're going to compare what it says in the King James Version with what it says in my Good News Bible. Okay, here's a familiar passage, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give him glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of water. Okay, compare that with this. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message, of good news, we have already talked about in our last message, the idea of eternal, everlasting covenant here. The everla eternal message of good news to announce to the people's birth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation, he said in a loud voice, honor God 
and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Okay. What do we see? What difference did we see? The older translation has fear. The newer translation has honor. Is that, does that mean somebody was mixed up, or that, why is there that difference? That's a better translation that latter has. It just means that the translators in the more modern translation took into account the whole setting and said, yeah, that's what fear in that context meant to honor, to reverence, to respect. Notice once again that the modern versions translate the word fear in the original Greek with the word honor or respect. This is what it means in the context of that verse. This is the message that Seventh-day Adventists have been told to carry to the world in our generation. Are we carrying the message to the world of honor and respect to God? There are many passages in Scripture suggesting why God chose the children of Israel and why He loved them. Jim? Deuteronomy 4, 37. Because He loved our ancestors, He chose you, and by His great power, He Himself brought you out of Egypt. So and because not, what? Because He what? Because He loved your ancestors. Okay. Go ahead. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8. The Lord did not love, love you and choose you because as you were outnumbered other people, you were the smallest nation on earth. But the Lord loved you and wanted to keep the promise that he made to your ancestors. This is why he saved you by his great might and set you free from slavery to the king of Egypt. Okay, so were the children of Israel taken out of Egypt through those plagues and through the Red Sea and all that stuff, just because he liked their ancestors? Or he loves them. Okay, but if the children of Israel had a reason to love God because of God saving them from slavery in Egypt, I mean, you know, the people who experienced slavery in Egypt, do you think they were happy to get out of it? Surely. We, at our point in history, certainly have many more reasons for loving him after his coming and living and dying for us. I mean, look at what Jesus did. Just amazing. Um, we have just opened a hospital here, a new hospital here in Loma Linda, and there's some marvelous paintings in there of the miracles that Christ performed when he was here on this earth. And they are awesome. If you get a chance to come to Loma Linda ever, but I'm just reminded that one plate, one of those paintings, you can see Jesus. One of the, he's he's raising the young that the girl uh, from the dead, the, Jairus' daughter. Jairus's daughter, and he touches her, and you can see her hand is already turning pink, but her face is still gray. It's just totally awesome. You look at that and you say, "Wow!" Just Nathan Green. Yeah. Just think of life-giving power just flowing in right there. He, you know, she's still lying there, and he's picking up her hand, and mm. it's already turning pink. Mm. Wow. We believe that God's omniscience includes his understanding everything from ancient times to all future time. And incredible as that may seem to us, we are told that God loved us, knowing all the problems we would cause even before our world was created. Now, this is part of what's implied by everlasting, right? Carrie? I'm reading from Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 4. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be His through our union with Christ, so that we would be holy and without fault before Him because of his love. That comes from Good News Bible. Okay, think about that. God planned for us to be a part of his family before this world was created. Every one of us was destined to be a part of his family. Now, some of us have chosen not to be a part of his family. We can choose. God doesn't force. But he chose from the beginning to make us a part of his family. Wow. So everyone has been predestined. 
It, yeah, it's, technically everybody has yes. been predestined to be saved. Right. Yes, yes. That is correct. Okay, going on. But I can reject that. There you are. Yep. Yes. Carrie, do you want to do the next one for us? Yes. As Ellen G. White said it, the earth was dark through misapprehension of God that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Let me interrupt for just a second. If love could be produced by force or authority, God could do that that fast, couldn't he? It, it just doesn't work. Well, it, it doesn't work, obviously. It's it pure fantasy. So <laughs> with thousands of years, God has struggled because he can't produce love by force. Very important point. Go ahead, Gary. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Now who, who would know the height and depth of the love of God? The believer. The God himself, right? Yes. God, you know, if, if we're gonna, if we need to, to know God, we talked about that in our last lesson, uh, if we need to know God, we need, uh, the person who comes to represent him must, can't be somebody else, it has to be God. Okay, go ahead. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. That's from Malachi 4.2. The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. <clears throat> God wasn't said, oops, what happened? He committed a sin, what am I going to do now? Yeah. No, it wasn't like that. Go ahead. Uh, where am I? It was a revelation. I think I'll start again. It, it'll flow a better... The plan for our redemption was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence through time is eternal. That's from Romans 16, verse 25, revised version. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. That's from Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages, page 22, one through two paragraph. Okay, so guess what are the principles that were the found, what's the principle, the single principle, which is the foundation of God's throne? Love. Love. Yeah. Uh, love is a principle that yeah. means it's not an emotional uh, no. feeling, it's just God ob operates at, at that way, is, mm -hmm. is love. Wait, also, Mercy. Remember it says, be uh, perfect as your Father in heaven, but then Luke it says, be merciful as your Father in heaven. We have been given a revelation of God's love through Jesus Christ. That would surely have been far beyond anything the children of Israel could have imagined in their day. For a moment, just consider how different our world would be and how different our relationship with God would be if he were like the gods of many of the ancient religions, arbitrary and vengeful and vindictive, even hateful and demanding and lots of other terrible words that you could think of. But God's love calls for action on our part. We can't just sit down and absorb it. Notice these passages. Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5, verse 10, But I show my love to thousands of generations of those who love me and obey my law. Deuteronomy 7, 9 to 10, Remember that the Lord your God is the only God and that he is faithful. He will keep his covenant and show his covenant love to a thousand generations of those who love him and obey his commands. 
but he will not hesitate to punish those who hate him. Okay, I'm going to ask a question about that. What happens to people who hate God? Does God have to do something terrible to them? Let, or does it just happen exactly. naturally? Huh? Let evil happen to them. Yeah, it they've just, chosen that. They've chosen not to to take follow the instruction the Creator has for them, so they he ultimately will honor their choice. Yep, sin pays its wage, death. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Deuteronomy ten, twelve, and thirteen. Now, people of Israel, listen to what the Lord your God demands of you: worship the Lord and do all that is he commands. Love him, serve him with all your heart, and obey all his commands, all his laws. I'm giving them to you today for your benefit. For your benefit. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. So what's the purpose of these laws? For your benefit. Deuteronomy 11, 1. Love the Lord your God, and always obey all his laws. Deuteronomy 19, 9, then you are to select three more cities. He will give you this land if you do everything that I have commanded you and if you love the Lord your God and live according to his teachings. Okay, so back to, this is, we haven't got to Deuteronomy 20 yet, where he go in and kill everybody. We're still thinking in terms of Exodus 23 there. Who's going to lead them into the land? And who's going to the take angel. care? The angel. And who's the angel? It's Christ. Yeah, the one who led them was Jesus Christ. He said, I will scatter your enemies. I, I won't scatter them so fast that you, the, the land becomes overrun, or overrun with wild animals. I, just let me take care of it. Boy. What a sad thing. No, we'd rather deal with our swords. Mm. It should immediately... So that we get the credit for it, right? Yes. So the nations around will respect us. <laughs> it should immediately follow from these passages that obedience to God should be the natural response to His love for us. God always wants what is best for us. Always. It may not seem like that right up front. And even though in our sinful, human, rebellious condition it may not seem natural to love God and obey His commandments, it is ultimately the best possible thing we can do for ourselves. Are there any of the Ten Commandments that seem arbitrary to you? Well, we don't think so. Hopefully a Seventh-day Adventist. But the obvious example in many people's minds is the keeping of the fourth commandment for the Sabbath. But just as young men and young women fall in love and wish to spend as much time as possible with each other, now why does that happen, I wonder? We should feel that same way about spending time with God. Why is that a problem? The Sabbath commandment is not arbitrary at all and keeping it is not legalistic. Not if we have the right relationship with God. Try to imagine what stories the older generation of the Israelites told their children and the years they were wandering the wilderness about what it was like to have been a slave in Egypt. Can you try to imagine that? What would you say? Let me tell me, let me talk to you about your grandfather. He was a slave in Egypt. Let me tell you about grandmother. Let me tell you, you know, let me tell you about the time they were killing all the babies. You know, how would that impact people? If God had brought you out of that situation, wouldn't you want to love him? Would you want to obey him instead of obeying an Egyptian taskmaster? Think about it. Unfortunately, many Christians in our day want to separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. It can't be done. They feel like the God of the Old Testament, who is who, by the way? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Is arbitrary and vindictive, contrasting, contrasted with the loving Jesus of the New Testament, which is their ideal. But we recognize that a careful study of the Old Testament and the New Testament reveals that the Old Testament is simply 
the principles of God worked out under very difficult circumstances mixed in among the truths about God. There is a promise of a coming Messiah, which then in turn is fulfilled in the New Testament. One example of the relationship between the Old Testament and the New is the fact that there are more than 600 implied or actually stated references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation alone. So how can you say, well, okay, we're going to throw out the Old Testament. Well, you're going to start pulling apart the New Testament and throw out all the parts of the New Testament that are quoted from the Old Testament? It wouldn't be too good, I wouldn't think. There's a well-known time when Jesus himself was asked by a teacher of the law, one of the scribes, which was the greatest commandment of all? Gordon? In Good News Bible, Mark 12, 28 to 30. A teacher of the law was there who heard the discussion. He saw that Jesus had given the Sadducees a good answer. So he came to him with a question, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, the most important one is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Okay. And where did those words first come from? The mouth of uh, God to Moses to the people in Deuteronomy 6. Okay, so Jesus is quoting himself. Yep. What would they have said if he had said, oh, this is what I said to Moses? They'd pick up stones. Yeah. <laughs> well, John 8, they did that, didn't they? When he said, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Grab a stone, folks. Wow. Jesus did not hesitate a moment when asked that question. He went straight to the words he himself had given to Moses as recorded in Deuteronomy 6. By the way, what's the reference for that God, that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament? Isn't that 1 Corinthians 10, 4? Well, 10, 1 to 4. I like to quote the Double. first four verses. Yeah, that, but also uh, John 5, 39 and Luke 24, uh, 44. Jesus says everything written about me in the Old Testament. Yeah, there's three powerful verses that support that. Would it be appropriate for us in our day to present in the best possible context and in the most loving way this message about our loving God to those around us who have not come to know him yet? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to do? We as Seventh-day Adventists have been told repeatedly that the three angels' messages are our message to the final generations living on this earth. Those messages end with these words, Revelation 14, 12, this calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. This calls for endurance. What does endurance mean? Don't give in, keep trying. Keep Don't trying. give in. Keep, keep working on it, right? right? So the people who live at the end, the remnant, it's, they're called, they're gonna have some tough times to go through. It's a marathon, not a 100 meter dash. That's right. Correctly understood, obeying God's commandments means being faithful to Jesus and all that he represented when he lived on this earth. And in the final generations of this world's history, every individual will ultimately have to choose between, one, the loving, obedient side, following God's directions and seeking to be more like Jesus each day, or two, the selfish, envious, boastful, proud steps that Satan originated in heaven in the very presence of God. Which side do you want to choose? Think about it. Or more to the point, which side do we practice being like every day in every activity that we do? One of the questions that is sometimes asked is, how can you love God whom you've never seen and never seen? We breathe air that we can feel, but we cannot see. We believe in gravity and we can feel it, even though we cannot see it. It should not be too difficult for us to understand that we need to love God, even though we have not seen him. 
him? The, Christ, excuse me, the cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realm of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to lift, excuse me, to uplift fallen man. That he bore the guilt and the shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woe of a lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. Wow. The might, excuse me, the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies should, excuse me, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder the ad and adoration of the universe. I'm gonna interrupt for a second. Do you think when you get to heaven you'll be allowed to go up and give him a hug? Yes. That didn't take long, did it? <laughs> You've thought yeah. of that before? <laughs> yeah. You've been asked that question before? <laughs> yeah, wow. And, you know, for someone to have that kind of power, you know. And come down and call us friend. Yeah. I do not call you a servant anymore. Your friend, yes. As the uh, go ahead, Jim. As the nations of the saved looked upon their Redeemer and behold the eternal glory of the Father shining in His countenance, as they behold His throne, which is from everlasting to everlasting, and to know His kingdom is to have no end. They break forth in rapturous song, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us to God by His own most precious blood. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 651 and 2. Wow, and that's quoting, of course, Revelation 5. You know, there's something very interesting there in Revelation 4 and 5. And if you, in a, Revelation 4, the camera, you know, for Revelation 2, 1, 2, and 3, are to, uh, 1 is to John, and then he, 2 and 3 talks about the churches. And then in 4, in 4 all of a sudden, heaven is open and he, look, he looks into heaven. And what do you see? You see, first of all, it's the, the, four chair, the four living creatures praising God. And then it's the four living creatures and the 24 elders praising God. And then it's those two groups plus all of the angels praising God. And then finally, it's the entire universe praising God because of what? Because of what he's done. Amazing. Just, I'm... I remember one time when I, was a, when I was a kid, we went to a general conference, and they had decided to, com to produce a combined choir, 200 people, and it was awesome. 200 people singing in harmony. Imagine 100 million angels mm -hmm. singing in harmony, whoa. Yeah. Well, try to imagine the thought that the God who has the power to create worlds, and in fact, did create the entire universe, chose to come down and live and die that incredible death on the cross, apparently, uh, apparently abandoned by his Father. My, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And what we have come to call the second death for us. One of the challenges of understanding the idea of fearing and loving at the same time is found in 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. That's from the New King James Version. Okay, so if perfect love casts out fear, how can you fear God and love Him? Aren't those contradictory? Same word. Yeah. Same word with very different meanings, isn't it? Yeah. Fear can be respect and honor. It can also mean abject terror. So that's... Terror for someone who does not fear. Yeah. Who does not yeah. love. Yeah, yeah. Once again, this is an illustration of the challenges of translating from one language to another. 
fear in this verse means terror or being scared to death. When we have a perfect love for God and recognize that our entire lives were tied up with his love for us, that kind of fear should disappear. That does not mean that we lose our respect for him. It will only grow. So why do we love God? One explanation is found in 1 John 4, 19. We love because God loved us first. Yes. It's interesting to notice that in the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, the two books that talk most of all about love are Song. Deuteronomy and the Song of Songs and the Song of Solomon, or the Song of Solomon. And what's the Song of Solomon talk about? His bride. His bride and the love for that bride. His very, not his only bride, unfortunately, but, <laughs> but the one he really liked, apparently, out of the thousand, right? But these are the two books that talk mostly more about, most about love. This should help us to understand that love has to do with relationships. So in this lesson, we have talked about three major themes, love and God, love and fear, and love and the law. Okay, love and God, what are we supposed to do that involves love and God? We're supposed to love God because he first loved us. And we've talked about love and fear and how they could be related. Of course, the real answer to that is understanding the, the, the original meaning of fear, right? And love and the law. And what did we say about love and the law? Did we learn something from this lesson? We said that the law, there are two great, great laws. What are they? Love for our Creator and love toward one another. Okay, and then the Ten Commandments, which is usually the, what we think of when we mention the law, is there first four, four. the first four are for love, love for God, and the last six are love for our fellow man, yeah. right? So this entire lesson that we've been talking about now is, and let's break this down carefully bit by bit, Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. See if we can understand it in more depth, okay? From the Good News Bible. <clears throat> These are all the laws that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. Now I'm gonna back up for just a second. He has just finished giving a repeat of the Ten Commandments. And then he said, these are the laws that you're supposed to obey. And now he's saying, remember, there were no breaks between chapters and verses and all that kind of stuff like we have now in, in their Bibles. So these are all the laws. Go ahead. That, that God has commanded me, Moses, to teach you. Obey them in the land that you are about to enter and occupy. As long as you live, you and your descendants are to honor the Lord your God and obey all his laws that I am giving you so that you may live in that land a long time. Okay, so I'm going to ask another question. Excuse me for interrupting a lot this time, but what does obeying God and following the Ten Commandments have to do with living a long time? Is this sort of some magic that God just says, oh, there's somebody who's obeying my will, I'm going to help him live longer? Well, that's a promise. Okay, it's a promise. How is the promise fulfilled? I think if we live according to God's yeah. plans, we will be happier. And we've, there are studies that show that happiness, joy, humor, etc., help you, help your body in many ways, your immune system and so on, and live a longer, better life. Yep, yeah. absolutely. And he says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whoever yes. destroys this temple, I'm going to destroy. So we have to respect this body as well. So mm -hmm. when we do, do we get yeah. the benefit? So listen to them, these laws. Go ahead, Gordon. So uh, verse 3, listen to them, people of Israel, and obey them. They all, then. then all will go well with you, and you will become a mighty nation and live in that rich and fertile land, just as the Lord, the God of our ancestors, has promised. Is, now, did you, uh, hold on a ahead. second. Is that the ultimate goal for the children of Israel, become a mighty nation? Hope not. 
Okay, go ahead. Verse 4, Israel, remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We've heard that before, huh? That sounds like New Testament, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, Jesus did quote it, huh? Never forget these commands that, uh, that I am giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you are at home and when you are away, when you are resting and when you are working. Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay, do we know how this is being done by some in the world? If you go to Jerusalem and you travel down to the Western Wall, you go in there and if you, especially if you claim to be a Jew, but even if you don't have to claim to be a Jew, if you walk over to the left-hand side, they will say, would you like some of these? And they will show you how to tie them on your arms and they will show you <clears throat> how to tie them on your forehead and you can go down to the wall looking like a real saint, okay? And you know also that on the doorposts in their houses, if a Jew builds a house, he's supposed to take a small thing of scripture with a, in a little case and puts it at a 45 degree angle in the doorpost. What's the reason for that? Following the rules. Well, following the rules, but if you, if you put it this way, it means you're trying to relate to other human beings. If you put it that way, you're relating only to God. So if you put it this way, 45 degrees, that means you're relating to God and to your fellow human beings. So that's, at least that's the way they want it to be understood. Clearly, this passage refers to the Ten Commandments, which had just been repeated in Deuteronomy 5. While the first four commandments specifically talk about our relationship to God and the last six talk about our relationship to our fellow human beings, it's also true, I would claim, that if we truly love God and have a right relationship with Him, all ten of these commandments will come naturally. To love God obviously implies that we believe that God exists as a personal being. Can you love a, well, Okay, if you just love a thing, what are you really saying? It's, it, 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 you love it because it does something for you, right? So, real love, we, we, at least I would say this, real love happens not between people and things, but between people that really love each other. Uh, and so, if we're gonna say we, we love God, that, that implies we're applying that God is a, is a personal being. We're not just loving an abstract principle or even a profound wisdom or a beautiful story. To understand him and to love him implies we recognize that he is present with us everywhere at all times. Is that possible? Well, we can't fathom exactly how God is everywhere at all times, but he's, he, he says absolutely he is. Ken, going yeah. back for just a moment, you said, if we have a loving relationship with God, all these, all of these commandments will come naturally. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll be good friends with him, we'll honor him, and so on, and we'll love our fellow man. Does a Sabbath commandment follow naturally? Would we naturally fo worship God, especially well, every seventh day? Well, I will, I will go back to what we said earlier in this lesson. If we really love God, now God says, you know, there's, there's two parts of that commandment. One compartment says, one major part says, you're supposed to work for six days. That's what you're supposed to do to support yourself, support your family, take care of everything. But now the special part comes, God says, okay, but there's one day that's special just for you to relate to me. And I suggested that when young people come to love each other, what do they do? Spend time together. They get up in the middle of the night or whatever it takes to have time to spend more, to do things and have more time to spend with that special someone. So I don't think there's, I think that fits in perfectly. Psalms 119, 70, 92, and 97. And who wrote Psalm 119? David. David. 
And here's what he says. He's been talking, remember Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. It's a very, very special poem, actually. The first eight verses uh, begin, begin with the word Aleph, with the letter Aleph. The next eight verses begin with the letter Beth and right through the Hebrew alphabet, 24 letters, 24 sections, each eight, eight verses in each section, amazing. But anyway, down toward the end now, we're going to verses 70, 92, and 97. These people that are, aren't God's people, they have no understanding, but I find pleasure in your law. If your law had not been the source of my joy, I would have died from my sufferings. Not sure exactly what led him to say that, but basically he, he really, he said, God's law does everything for me. How I love your law, I think about it all day long. David was suggesting that keeping God's commandments is not something that we do in addition to loving God. If we love God, Keeping his commandments is a perfect expression of that love. Um, and why is it that we have such a hard time sort of believing and practicing that? Any idea? Because we're naturally selfish. Right? It's, it, to, to, to learn to, to be loving, I mean... Take a small child. What do they think about a baby, an infant? What are they? All they can think about is their own needs, right? Yeah. So we have to grow up. We have to learn. We have to learn to love. So to sum up the very essence of this lesson, we read the following from our Bible study guide: the fact that God commands us in. I'm going to work through this because we're going to break it up. The fact that God commands us to love is not a problem because God is love, 1 John 4, 8. So if God is love, what do you have to do to relate to him? You have to be loving. How, he, doesn't, he doesn't say, well, cozy up to me for, by hate. No, cozy up to me by love. To love God is the commandment because it cannot be otherwise is the commandment because it cannot be otherwise. It is the absolute imperative because of who God is and what God is, if you, depending on how you want to describe that. Thus, because God is love, the commandment involves the totality of our being. Love stems from the heart. That is, from within, from what is not visible. From our most intimate thoughts and feelings, our profound intentions. Now, again, the idea is that, of course, we know that this is not talking about the, 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 the muscle in our chest. When we talk about the heart in the Bible, what is it talking about? Our mind, the way we our think. Our mind, the way we think, and so forth. So <clears throat> we're talking about here from our most intimate thoughts and feelings, our profound intentions. Significantly, the commandment that concludes the Decalogue, you shall not covet, Deuteronomy 5.21, of course, that's also in Exodus 20, gives at the end of the law the inner key to all the commandments. So why is, what is that? What's, what's different about the Tenth Commandment? I can't tell whether you're obeying the Tenth Commandment, and you can't tell if I am. Okay. It's and and where, does God. where does coveting happen? In, in the mind. mind. In the mind. And could coveting lead us to kill, to envy, to disrespect God, to, yeah. It's if, about every, about as self-centered as you could possibly get in it. Yep. Yeah. And it would, it would, it leads us to disregard God. I mean, pretty soon we, all we care about is ourselves. Okay. It is not enough to have the law, to have the truth, to know that we should not kill or commit adultery. Moreover, to refrain from committing adultery or from killing is not enough. We should not even think about it or desire it. Coveting, thinking about that kind of stuff. What happens in the mind? Matthew 5, 28. Because love is a passion, our response of love to God is pressing. It emanates from our heart today. Deuteronomy 6, 6. It is not just an act of memory or hope for the future. It, it is present and involves our daily life. To love God, who is always present in his love, 
is to make God relevant in our present life. Therefore, to love God who loves is total. It embraces all, not only all your heart, but also all your soul, Deuteronomy 6, 5, which means all your person. And it does not stop there because of what love is, it implies intensity. We cannot love God in a mediocre or lackluster way from our adult Sabbath school adult teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 54. The Jews in the days of Jesus took the words of Exodus 13, 9, and 16, along with the words of Deuteronomy 6, very literally, and tied pieces of Scripture onto their foreheads and their wrists. Some of the Jews living today still do that, as we mentioned earlier. These little boxes with Scriptures in them are called phylacteries, or if you're using Hebrew, tefillin. Obviously, God does not intend for us to tie little boxes on our foreheads or on our wrists. But what do these commands mean? Meditate on the lessons of faith and devotion that are symbolized in all the gestures of this, of, these, of this practice. You shall bind. The law of God should be tightly connected to our physical persons. The binding also suggests the idea of faithfulness and a loving relationship to God. So on your hand, Deuteronomy 6, 8, the law of God should affect our actions. Between your eyes, uh, the law of God should not affect our, should uh, affect our mind and our discernment. Write them on the doorposts. The law of God should affect our homes and everything that goes on in our homes, right? Again, from our Sabbath School Teacher's Guide, pages 55 and 56. In this lesson, we have seen that loving God is an all-encompassing principle. It involves us everywhere we go, whatever we do, whomever we relate to. Is that possible in the 21st century? Think about all the people we pass on the street. The guy who's standing there with a sign saying, please give me money so I can buy some alcohol. Well, he doesn't usually say that, but well, that's what he—that's what he might want. I think one of the guys says, "Why lie? I just want another drink." Yeah. Okay. Can we really love all those people? I—I have—I have—I have a hard time. I will say with some of the patients that come to my office, and they're very, very demanding. They think, "Well, I have, I'm in charge of this place." So forth. Well, we have to learn to love all of those people. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father. We've come here to represent you, to think about you, hopefully to think of ways in which we can represent you to all around us, that they may see something of your character and your love in us. We think of Moses and these final messages he's giving to the children, he was giving to the children of Israel. What a blessing it could have been to them if they had followed them. So help us take advantage of what they missed is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.